So, today I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Ryan Smith from the Laureate Institute of Brain Research, the uh, University of Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the USA. Ryan Smith has received his PhD in psychology from the University of Arizona in 2015 and worked as a postdoctoral researcher in Arizona in the lab of Professor William Kilgo until 2018. He then spent a year in the, professor, in the lab of Professor Carl Friston as a visiting researcher and in 2019 he's a member of the Lerac Institute of Brain Research where I think he's still working as a principal investigator. Brian Smith is the author of many publications in the field of effective neuroscience, neuroimaging and models of the brain and he offered a great contribution in the development and application of the free energy principle and active influence framework which uh, are the main topics of this semester's seminar series. And together with Carl Friston and Christopher White, he recently published a fantastic tutorial on active inference that I would like to recommend to anyone that is approaching, like me and many of us, to this topic. So, Ryan, we are really glad to have you here today, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. The mic is yours. Okay, well, yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I do have basically exactly an hour worth of material if I can even get through all of it. So I'm um, just to prepare everybody and feel free to just, you know, kind of cut me off if I start going too long, but I'm hoping I can get through as much of it as, as possible. Um, so let me just share my screen here. Um, make sure this all works. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, so like um, I said, so just kind of, jump in here. Um, my talk officially is titled Active Inference as a Computational Framework for Modeling Empirical Data. And the reason I say that is, is just because my lab mainly is focused on trying to apply active inference models as a way of um, essentially studying individual differences in, in behavior and largely in computational um, psychiatry, so in, in clinical populations. So part of my goal is to kind of uh, illustrate how active inference can be used to model empirical tasks um, that can then um, allow uh, fitting and, and then you can um, study individual differences in, in particular computational mechanisms. Um, so the, the general kind of outline, I'll, I'll try to give a brief kind of conceptual introduction to active inference. Um, and then I'll, I'll introduce you and walk you through the, um, the formalism, which can initially be fairly daunting, um, but I'm hoping that kind of by the end, um, it'll, it'll seem a lot more comprehensible. Um, so that'll include um, the way that perception relates to variational free energy minimization um, and how that relates to prediction error minimization. Um, we'll talk about policy selection and expected free energy minimization. Um, and then hopefully if I have time, we'll get to, to act, active learning. Um, and then um, I'll briefly kind of touch on um, empirical applications throughout. Um, so uh, kind of highlighting how active inference can make um, both behavioral and neural predictions that can be tested um, in empirical studies. Um, and I should just say right from the bat, uh, right off the bat, there's uh, way too much packed in here. Um, so I'm going to point you kind of throughout toward further resources as we go. And um, since this will be recorded, I'm hoping people can kind of go back and, and um, um, see those pointers to those. Um, so first, you know, what is active inference generally? So I think it's important to, to recognize from the start here that um, active inference is a term that's actually been used in multiple ways. Um, so the term was actually initially used to refer to a, a theory of predictive motor control um, starting uh, around 2013, a little before, um, which was essentially an extension of um, prediction-based models like predictive coding, um, extension of those sorts of models of perception to the idea of, of motor control through prediction. Um, currently, however, active inference is, is more often used to refer to a, a different but related theory, which is a theory of predictive decision making as opposed to motor control. Um, and that's what we're talking about in this lecture. Um, and both of these theories are they're grounded in Bayesian inference or probability theory. Um, one is just about deciding what to do, which is what we're talking about. And the other is just about controlling the body to enact a decision once it's made. Um, and if people want more details on kind of the historical walkthrough and distinction between those in more detail, this is just one paper that we recently put out that the, um, the beginning portion um, describes that um, and makes that distinction, or we tried to make it as clearly as we could. Um, but the, the basic idea with active inference is that agents are, aren't simply passive observers of their environment. Um, and so they actually, they, they actively infer the probability of future observations given the, the different possible actions that they might choose. So you might start out saying, okay, if I go inside, I predict that I'm going to feel warmer. Um, and then you combine those with predictions. Um, you combine that with preferences. Um, so I want to feel warm, therefore I will go inside. Um, 
And then the other thing that's useful about active inference is that it also models agents making um, information seeking actions. So they gather information when it will be useful. So for instance, I'm gonna turn on my flashlight right now because I predict this is gonna help me figure out how to get inside. Um, so all of those things are kind of encompassed in this like active, um, active inference as opposed to just passive inference. Um, now, just to kind of introduce a few kind of initial starting variables here. So first we have observations O, um, and then we represent hidden states with the variable S. And the idea is that those are, are hidden because they have to be inferred from observations. Um, and then we have PI, which stands for policies, which are sequences of actions where each action is represented as U. And the idea here in the figure above is we want to distinguish between the generative model and something called the generative process. Um, and the generative model here is represented by this joint probability of essentially it's all the it's the probability that you believe is associated with each possible combination of observation states and policies. Um, and what that allows you to do is kind of work out what you think will happen, what you think the probability is of different observations, um, given your beliefs about states and what action you choose. So you might say, okay, what might I do to stop this flame that I think I'm perceiving over here? Well, probably the best policy or the best action is just to blow, just blow out the candle. Um, now there's a difference between that and the generative process, which is just the actual objects, you know, uh, objects and events that are that are out in the um, in the environment itself. So where the generative model here is the beliefs about those things, and that could be inaccurate, but there is some true states in op of the world that are generating real observations and the brain's just trying to model um, and get a handle on those the best as possible. Um, so this is a common <laughs> depiction, um, the common very daunting <laughs> depiction of active inference um, that you'll often see in papers. On the left here is the, the graphical model depiction and the right is all the equations for inference to solve um, this graph. Um, and so we'll walk through each of these steps in detail in a second, but um, just to kind of motivate this, I wanna start out by kind of illustrating what, what active inference is actually good for to motivate why um, you might want to learn it and understand it. Um, so first is um, it incorporates perception learning and decision making all within a within a single model. Um, so it allows the framework to be applied to a really wide range of problems, um, including perception tasks, reinforcement learning tasks, planning tasks, um, among others. Um, and the equations that I just showed that are used for inference are, are fully generic across different generative model architectures. So really, you just need to come up with the right generative model for whatever you're trying to model, and then the, the same exact equations will um, perform approximately optimal inference um, for whatever the generative model structure is. Um, so the task is just to figure out the right generative model um, structure to, uh, to simulate um, a particular cognitive process or behavioral task. Um, so the other thing is it's motivated by biological plausibility. So in other words, there's clear ways in which neural networks can implement all the linked equations in the model. Um, and it has an accompanying neural process theory, um, which is often depicted like this with these little kind of ball neurons and, um, and synaptic connections um, that um, I'll, I'll walk through this in a, a minute, but the point is for, or, well, later in the talk, but for the, the moment, the idea is just that it provides um, the opportunity to make uh, and test precise uh, hypotheses in neuroimaging studies. So including predicting ERPs in EEG studies or um, localized neural responses in fMRI studies. Um, and then the last thing um, that I like to highlight is that it provides a unique approach for modeling the explore, explore exploit trade-offs. Um, so it kind of helps answer the question or, or models the agent trying to answer the question of when do I seek reward immediately or when do I first seek out information so I have a better idea of where the rewards are. Um, so it's a useful framework for modeling behavioral tasks that involve the sort of information seeking and planning component. Um, now, just pointing you to some further resources, this is a paper that um, we wrote recently that um, is just kind of a review of recent applications. Um, and then I'll just point you also to a number of empirical studies that we and others have done. So these are a few that we've done modeling and fitting models to beha empirical behavioral data on information seeking and learning. Um, it's a couple of papers that we've um, published looking at planning behavior. Um, and then there's a couple studies, not many to date, looking at neuroscientific predictions and testing those against either EEG or fMRI data. Um, so, so the idea is that it's already, you know, there's already, it's already somewhat established or starting to be that this is useful um, for like practical scientific purposes. Um, 
And so, uh, as they mentioned, we, we put out this tutorial recently that we hoped would make um, some of this material clearer and more accessible for people who want to use this modeling framework in their, in their own um, studies. Um, and so a lot of what I'll be talking about going forward will draw pretty heavily on this, um, on this tutorial. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge it here and my, and my co-authors on it um, as a, just another place to look for more details. Um, so in the formalism for active inference, um, it's based on what are called partially observable Markov decision processes or POMDPs. Um, so the, the idea here is that it's modeling hidden states of the world that evolve over time. Um, and as I said, the agent doesn't have full knowledge of the environment, so it has to infer states from observations. Um, and then it has to also infer the policies or action sequences that are most likely to generate preferred observations based on current beliefs. Um, and I just want to make a brief clarification for anyone who does reinforcement learning um, at all, that the term policy is actually a little different in reinforcement learning versus active inference. So in reinforcement learning or model-free reinforcement learning, um, policies often refer to mapping from states to actions. So for example, just rules, you know, if I'm in state one, then I will go left, or I'm in state two, then I'll go right. Um, an active inference of policy refers to a possible sequence of actions of some preset depth, some preset number of actions. So, for example, one policy might be, I will go left, then left, then right, whereas another might be, I'll go right, then right, then left. Um, so the idea is an active inference, you're, you're evaluating the, the whole sequence um, of actions in terms of whether it will lead to the observations that you want. Um, so just an additional notation here, and just as a, another kind of a, explicit illustration of the policy idea. If we have, you know, in this maze, we might have kind of the starting position and this goal. Um, one policy might be this whole sequence of 10 actions, whereas another policy might be this whole sequence of 14 actions in this case. And uh, the first one would be favored here um, because it gets you there more quickly. Um, so the idea is that we're evaluating everything under policies and active inference because the goal is just to choose a policy. So prior beliefs in Bayesian inference, which I've been told everyone here is, you know, ought to be familiar with Bayesian inference, so I'm not going to um, give an intro on that. But priors over states instead become priors over states conditional on policies. So the state I expect to be in if I give a, if I choose a given policy, and then same thing for likelihood mappings. Um, so the observations I expect if I'm in a state and I choose this policy, um, same thing, posterior beliefs, it's just the probability of states given some set of observations and a policy. Um, and that's often the kind of thing, as we'll see, that we want to figure out in perception. Um, and then we can just solve that with Bayes' theorem in the standard way. Um, so, and then we have predictive posteriors over observations, which is going to be really important for policy selection, as we'll see. Um, and so those are the observations I expect if I choose a policy. And then another thing that's fairly unique in active inference um, is this idea of a prior preference distribution. So probability of observations given C, which is just this variable that we um, use as a matrix essentially that encodes what we, what we want, what observations we want over others. Um, and so higher probability here um, just indicates that something's more rewarding or more desired. Um, so like I said, this is a unique element in active inference. Um, because it's using something with the form of a probability distribution to encode relative reward values. Um, another thing to, to note here for people who aren't familiar with um, variational inference um, as, a, as an approximate um, Bayesian inference technique, um, we use the variable Q to denote approximate distributions um, because exact Bayesian inference is just often very intractable in real world cases. Um, so Q is essentially kind of like our best guess about whatever belief it's, it's um, indexing. So here, QS given pi would be our approximate posterior over states um, where we'd want to get that to match the posterior, the true posterior as closely as possible. And QO given pi would be our approximate prediction about what we'll observe if we choose one policy over another. Um, the last kind of thing that I, I would want to introduce for anyone who isn't familiar is the uh, concept of a KL divergence. Um, and the idea here is just that smaller values for a KL divergence indicate that two distributions are more similar. Um, and this becomes really important in action selection and active inference because in this case, the closer we can get QO given pi with PO given C, the smaller the KL divergence will be, which means the probability is just higher that we'll get what we want. Um, so to give you kind of a practical example, um, so take QO given policy one um, and whatever our preference distribution is. If the distributions look like this, so this red distribution being the expected observations given a policy, these are pretty far apart. 
Um, so that would be a large KL divergence. Whereas if we take policy two, uh, in this case, the predicted observations under the policy are much closer to the preferred observations. Um, and so that's kind of a smaller KL divergence. And so that's gonna be a policy that has a higher chance of being selected um, by an active inference agent. Um, so now to kind of get through the, the okay. graphical model itself um, to kind of parse this so it's more comprehensible. Um, so here arrows denote um, conditional dependencies. Um, circles correspond to random variables that are updated during learning. So in this case, we have our, our S's here and our pi's, and these are just, um, these stand in for QS and Q pi, so our approximate beliefs. Um, the squares indicate fixed parameters, um, which I'll, I'll walk through, but these are the things that are kind of fixed within a given trial, but that are updated more slowly uh, through learning. Um, so as I mentioned, this can be a bit daunting, um, but when we walk through it step by step, I think you'll find that it's, it's um, more comprehensible. Um, so this bottom part here, the states and observations, um, is um, what roughly corresponds to perception in active inference models, whereas this whole part on the top um, involving policies and the things that policies depend on is the, the action selection part. Um, so we'll start by just walking through the static and dynamic perception um, part of these models, so that bottom part. Um, and to do so, uh, I'll use a, I want to use a concrete task as an example, and this is what we used in the tutorial. Um, so in this task, um, the uh, agent has to choose between one of two slot machines, and if they choose the right one, then they'll win $4, um, whereas the other one will pay out $0. Um, and if they guess right away, um, then they get the $4, but they can also choose to ask for a hint. So this like information seeking action. Um, and if they do that, then um, they'll find out which one is more likely to pay out, but there's a, a loss involved because then they can only win $2. So it is specifically this kind of information seeking versus direct reward seeking trade-off. Um, and the perception part um, is just gonna involve this um, observing the hint in this case. So one hidden state factor in the model is just gonna be which machine is better, the left machine or the right machine, and the outcome or observation modality here is gonna have three possible observations, just no hint, the hint that the left machine is better and the hint that the right machine is better. Um, so that's what we're gonna to use to model perception in this case. Um, so to start out, we'll just pick kind of the smallest little unit in the graphical model where we just have observations, hidden states, and then we have A, which is the likelihood. So the probability of observations given states, and then we have D, which is just our prior belief about states. Um, so observations, hidden states, prior beliefs about states, and the likelihood mapping. Um, and then we can solve this um, just by, this is just a way of encoding Bayes' theorem essentially, um, where it's just, here's your prior, here's your likelihood, and then you soft max this, um, just to turn the result back into a probability distribution. Um, and so just to give a concrete example here, um, in, the, um, in the context of the explore exploit um, uh, task, um, we can start out just by assigning an equal prior probability to uh, L here, which would the left machine being better and uh, R here for the right machine being better. And then we can, um, and then we can say our observation um, is a one, and here a one and a zero, and that just encodes in this case that the, uh, the hint that the left machine is better. Um, and if this is our likelihood function, um, then this observation here would pick out the top row, which is just saying that, so left machine um, has a 0.9 probability of being the case, given that the, you got the left hint, um, or I said that backwards, but, but the probability of the left machine better is point, uh, probability that the left machine is uh, better is uh, higher um, under the, uh, with the left machine um, hint. So we can just use those probabilities um, and to figure out the uh, posterior over states here. And just to show you how you would do that, just to carry out that equation, um, we end up with this, which then once you soft max it becomes that, which is just saying that now there's a 0.82 probability that the left machine is more likely to pay out. Um, so moving on from that to dynamic perception um, now requires that I, I make a kind of distinction that's, that's, been a, that's a little tricky um, often when people are learning active inference to start with. And that's the fact that there's different um, types of time in active inference. Um, so the first notion of time uh, is indexed by this Greek letter tau 
And that's the time about which I have a belief. So for instance, I might believe right now that I'm in a car, um, but I might believe that I was in the kitchen 10 minutes ago. Um, and I might believe that I will be at work in 20 minutes. So those are beliefs that I have about three different times, but I have all of those beliefs right now in the present. Um, so T is the time uh, at which I have a new observation. Um, so the belief at which I have all these beliefs about the different times. Um, so here we might say after turning on a light, so I make some observation that say T equals uh, at T or at, yeah, at tau equals T then I believe now that I was in the kitchen for the last five minutes, so at whatever tau minus one was. Um, so in other words, I can get an observation later and it can update my belief about where I was at an earlier time, um, although I didn't know that before turning on the light. So I can update my little belief about all taus, um, the states at all taus with each new observation at each t. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, and note again that the variable q here is just denoting our our uh, approximate belief or best guess, like I mentioned before. Um, so, and then the other thing, and I mentioned this already, but there's a different thing between, there's um, important to distinguish different state factors and outcome modalities. Um, the idea is that different factors can correspond to different types of states. So like one set of states might be beliefs about an object's identity, whereas another set of states might be about the object's location. Um, or one set of outcomes might be about vision and another set of outcomes might be about audition. So we separate different types of states into factors and different types of observations or outcomes into modalities. Um, so, so here, when we're modeling dynamic perception um, as a, a hidden Markov model, all we're doing is we're just taking the single time point inference here that I showed before and just kind of stringing them together. Um, and then we're connecting the states over time with these B matrices here that just encode the probability of moving to some state given that I was in some state at a previous time. Um, so we encode, these are just the probability of state transitions. Um, and these are essentially, you can think about them as providing the prior beliefs for states um, for all taus greater than one. Um, and the equation for solving this in active inference um, is essentially the same in form as the one for the single, um, for solving it for the single time point. The only difference is now, um, so the likelihood here is exactly the same. The difference here is that our prior belief now includes, um, for tau equals one, now includes our beliefs from the past and also beliefs about, prior beliefs about where we'll be going in the future. Um, and, um, and for tau greater than one, um, it's the exact same thing, except for instead of D here, our prior from the past is just the B from the previous time point, and our prior from the future is um, the same as it was here. Um, so this idea of prior of having prior beliefs from the future is also something that people often find a little confusing at first, um, but this just goes back to this T versus tau distinction I mentioned before where this allows you to update beliefs about earlier time points when you're getting observations about later time points. Um, so this will allow you to kind of propagate, when you get an observation at time two, will allow you to kind of propagate beliefs back and update your beliefs about where you were at, um, at tau equals one. Um, now solving um, this uh, now requires, um, because it, we have to do it with approximate inference, um, gets in gets into uh, message passing algorithms. Um, and in this case with active inference, the main way that we tend to do it is with variational message passing or, um, or uh, an updated version called mar marginal message passing. Um, but that's what the equations I just showed you implement. Um, and as we'll see in a second, um, this message passing scheme is actually what the neural process theory in active inference is based on. Um, and um, so, uh, um, to uh, just go into this, the idea is, is that um, message passing is essentially an efficient way to do approximate posterior inference um, on a graph. Um, and um, so, and it's based on minimizing a quantity called variational free energy, which I'll, um, I'll go into after kind of giving you a practical example of how this, how the dynamics work. Um, so essentially what you do um, is you just start by, um, encoding whatever observation is one. So fixing fixing whatever observation is at tau equals one. And so let's say it's observation, the top observation here. So we'll just call that observation one. So now what you would do is you'd use that and you'd first try to update your belief about whatever states are for tau equals one. 
Um, and we do that just by passing these messages. So in other words, in this case, it's just the log, the natural log of the prior belief, um, and then the natural log of the prior belief from the future time point, um, and then our likelihood. Um, and we just put those together, and then we update our belief, our approximate belief about um, states at tau equals one. Um, and in this case, if I were to do that with actual numbers, um, it would just look like that. Um, so we'd update our belief about s at tau equals one to now be a 0 0.55, 0 0.45. Um, and then we would take that new QS, and we'd now use it to try to, try to update our beliefs about uh, states at tau equals two. Um, and then same thing, we get our QS equals two, then we do the exact same thing again, pass those messages, and get uh, our updated posterior belief for uh, s at tau equals three. Um, and then we just do that over and over again until eventually um, this will converge onto a, a stable updated prior or updated posterior belief about states at each of these uh, uh, time points. Um, and, and crucially, so that's all based just on making op the first observation. Um, so once we do that, um, we can assume that beliefs have now converged. Um, and now we add the second observation in. Um, and then we just do the whole thing again. Um, so after the new observation comes in, we update our beliefs about all the different time points. Um, so, and then we just repeat it again iteratively until we reach convergence. Um, and then we arrive at a final posterior belief, ultimately about all time points after all observations. Um, and you can kind of plot out the way that um, beliefs change. So in an easy inference problem, you have pretty fast convergence. So in this, in this graph, we have six different traces. So it's beliefs about each of the two possible states. So left, the left machine being better or the right machine being better. We have beliefs about each of those um, over each iteration of message passing. And what you can see here is this is just showing that really quickly beliefs that the left machine is better for all three time points um, converge to being one really quickly. If I were to make the inference problem harder by making um, the transition beliefs more probabilistic, for example, then you can see that the inference problem becomes harder and you have slower evidence accumulation. Um, and so it takes a lot longer for the beliefs to, um, to converge. Um, so, um, and as I mentioned before, this also represents a possible way to think about um, the way that messages are passed between neurons in the brain. Um, and this comes in part from the fact that we can um, think about message passing or it can be formulated, the equations can be formulated um, in terms of something like minimizing a prediction error. Um, and the way, you, the way you do that, and I won't go into this in a, in a ton of detail right now, but you can just kind of shuffle around the variables here a little bit um, and make it so that this is, the fixed point for this is zero as an error, um, which we represent like this. And then we're just moving the, uh, the S over here to the end. Um, and then message passing is described in an identical way, except for now that what it's doing is kind of every time you iterate it, it's moving toward um, this error being as low as possible. Um, and uh, the reason it, it, you can think about it as a prediction error is you have whatever over here, the generative model after an observation, and then you have your new approximate posterior over states and the, the difference here is essentially is essentially the error signal because you're trying to get these to match as well as possible. Um, and then you can define um, a kind of membrane voltage um, that would be associated with um, with the activity in a given neuron um, with this variable V, um, where V is uh, just the log of this posterior state. So it's just identical to this. Um, and, um, and that can take on continuous values like a membrane voltage Whereas um, softmaxing this, so normalizing it, um, then um, becomes your beliefs about states, um, which can then be um, thought about as a, a normalized firing rate, which um, can only take values between zero and one. Um, so that's kind of the, the really basic idea um, about um, that first part of the neural process theory is just you can, you can formulate message passing on a graph like I just showed you in terms of a prediction or minimization process. Um, and um, there's a, a nice paper by Thomas Parr, um, I guess, who's going to be talking to you at the next meeting, um, showing how, uh, just illustrating how you can connect um, a pretty small number of neurons together 
um, to uh, to implement this, just as a kind of concrete illustration, where the the state probabilities and the error signals are just represented by the activity in a set of neurons, where each one, each pair of neurons corresponds to beliefs about each moment in time, so each tau. Um, whereas the conditional probabilities, so the likelihood and the prior beliefs are just encoded in the synaptic weights, essentially the strength of the excitatory and inhibitory connections between each of these neurons. Um, so that's kind of the simplest um, aspect of the active inference, uh, the neural process theory and active inference. Um, so to kind of illustrate how this works practically in the in the task, so let's just say that I have completely precise prior beliefs about transitions. So if the left machine is better at time point two, um, then it will still be better at time point three. So this is all this is saying. It's just probability of left uh, at time point two is going to be uh, is also uh, going to be 100 you know, probability of one at uh, time point three. Um, so, um, so if we do that, then um, what I'll, what I'm showing here is, is just a, a set of graphs here where for tau equals one, tau equals two, and tau equals three, these are the posterior beliefs that the left machine is better and the right machine is better. Um, and here's the observations. And so darker here is going to equal higher probability. Um, and the cyan dots here, I'll show you, just correspond to whatever the true state or outcome or action is, depending on the specific um, plot. But so let's say we start out and there's a null observation, so it doesn't get any information. Um, so its beliefs don't change at all. Everything just stays flat and gray. But now at the second time point, it observes the, the, the hint that the left machine is better. Um, so now the update, the beliefs update. And note that they update for each time point. Right, so and now it believes that the left machine was better at tau equals one. It believes that it is better right now at tau equals two when it got this observation for t equals two. And it also now believes that the left machine is better at time point three or will be still be better at time point three, which is when it would make the choice about which machine it would choose. Um, and then it doesn't make any, it just makes the null observation here, but the beliefs basically stay the same about all time points. Um, this is just noting how the beliefs about both the past and the future change um, when it makes the observation at time point two. Um, so now if we were to do, um, if we were to just plot this, um, each of these rows, the way that um, I did before, um, literally you can just treat, as I mentioned, each of these, each of these traces as corresponding to predicted firing rates. Um, and then what, what leads um, active inference to be able to make material, um, Empirical predictions um, in terms of EEG studies is that you can um, you can just take the those voltage um, predictions or or really uh, something very equivalent would just be the um, rate of change in the posterior beliefs and that will generate um, ERP predictions um, and what this basically saying is just the faster the neural uh, the neural firing rates change the larger the ERPs will be um, and just to show how that can differ given um, different belief precisions, um, we can make it so that the priors over states, um, the transitions are, um, are less precise. So this version of a B matrix would say that if the left machine is better at time point two, it'll still be better at time point three, but only with probability of 0.7, right? So the left being better, transitioning to the left being better is only 0.7. Um, so in this case, if I do the exact same thing, then when it gets the left hint, now it's confident that the left machine is best at tau equals two, but it's no longer that confident um, that it was best at time point one and time point three because of the probability of the transitions are only 0.7. Um, so that's what makes the, the difference there um, when you have different uh, prior or transition belief precisions. <laughs> Um, and again, same thing with the neural process theory. Um, we get precise changes for the traces for tau equals two, but much less precise for tau equals one and tau equals three, um, which is going to predict a very different pattern of ERPs um, in an empirical study. Um, and there are a few papers now that either in simulations or in empirical studies um, that have shown um, evidence that these predicted RP ERPs um, match up well um, with um, empirically observed ERPs, um, which is uh, promising, but um, uh, still there's only a few studies so far. Um, and these are just examples of the 
ways that these traces kind of match. So like here's an empirical peer ERP and an inattentional blindness paradigm, and this is what a simulated ERP uh, looks like when you're modeling the same task. Um, so the the next kind of important thing, so I mentioned that um, I mentioned that this uh, message passing um, slash prediction or minimization sort of scheme was based on minimizing variational free energy. Um, so now I now that you have a sense of how the dynamics work, um, wanted to walk through um, and kind of explain formally what variational free energy is. Um, so the idea is that you're starting with some generative model, um, and in this case, I'm not including policies um, just for for simplicity. So in which case your generative model is just your joint of observation, probability of observations and states, which we know you can just represent as a conditional times a marginal here. Um, and then what we're doing with variational free energy is we're um, starting with a kind of arbitrary QS that we somehow want to get to approximate the true posterior as closely as possible. Um, and then we formulate F like this. So, and what you'll note is that there's this part here and there's this part. And this part um, is fairly intuitive in terms of the way that F minimizing F ends up minimizing a prediction error. Um, and the reason is, is because this is just putting our approximate posterior over our true posterior. Um, so it follows that the closer that QS gets to PS given O, um, the, the smaller this whole thing will be, right? So in other words, F gets smaller as our approximate posterior comes to match our true posterior. Um, so it's just the difference between the approximate and the true posterior. And then what's left over is just the log probability of the observations under the model. So just how surprising is the observation under my model in general, which is um, equivalent to the, the model evidence, essentially how good is your model at predicting observations overall. Um, so as F approaches zero, um, or F approaches zero, as your, as your posterior beliefs become more and more similar to your, uh, to the true posterior. Um, and just to kind of show how that works in this simple kind of example, um, if I start out with a prior belief that's just flat, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and I have a likelihood of 0.8 and 0.2, um, I can calculate my joint probability here, so just 0.4 and 0.1, um, and this um, step of calculating the marginal is what's intractable in real world cases. But if I were to do it, I end up with a posterior of 0.8 and 0.2. So with this approximate inference with variational free energy, what I would do is I just start my QS, my best guess at just 0.5 and 0.5, and then I can calculate an initial F value. Um, so here, just based on this version of the equation for um, variational free energy, um, which is just a kind of uh, shuffled around version of the variables from the one I showed you before. Um, I can calculate it as 0.916, um, and then I can just move QS a little bit. So now it's point, try it at 0.6.4, and I can see that F gets smaller. So then I can keep moving it in that direction. So 0 0.7, 0 0.3, F is smaller still. Um, and then when I get to 0 0.8.2, then F is 0 0.693. Um, and if I try to move it farther to 0 0.9.1, then you'll see F goes up again. Um, which means that this is going to be the value of QS, so the guess that best minimizes F, um, which in this case corresponds exactly to the true posterior, um, but it won't often um, match it exactly in um, in many real world more complex cases. Um, so that's so that's the idea. Um, now another way that you can represent variational free energy that um, that kind of brings out um, part of why it's useful. Um, aside from just being a tractable way to do Bayesian inference, um, is you can represent it as a KL divergence between your approximate posterior belief and um, and uh, the um, uh, prior here, your prior overstates. Um, so essentially, this is saying how much do beliefs need to change. So if I move from my prior belief to my posterior belief, and that requires a big change, then your KL divergence will be large. Um, so we can think about it as complexity in the sense that you're having to move your beliefs, change your beliefs a lot um, to, um, to get to your uh, best guess. Um, whereas this would just be the prediction part. So this is just the probability of the observations that I'm giving given the states um, in my model. Um, so this is just how accurate are my predictions. Um, and you can just flip this around and just think of this as complexity plus prediction error. Um, then, because again, this is just about the accuracy of your model's predictions. Um, 
So in other words, to minimize F, we're trying to minimize complexity. So we're trying to move our posterior beliefs as little as possible from our prior beliefs. Um, so the simplest change in beliefs um, that we can do um, while also maximizing accuracy. So adjusting beliefs to make the most accurate predictions possible. Um, so this is another way of seeing how convergence to QS in, our, in the message passing scheme we talked about before um, can be understood as uh, prediction error minimization. Um, and this is probably familiar to a lot of people, but sometimes the question comes up, you know, why worry about this complexity part? Why not just maximize accuracy? Um, and the reason is that the more complicated your model becomes, the easier it is to overfit. You know, so in this case, I can come up with this really complicated model that will predict each observation, you know, like perfectly, but it's going to be really bad at predicting new observations. So, you, so a model like this is kind of in the middle um, that um, requires uh, simpler, uh, simpler change in beliefs, um, predicts it pretty well, but is a lot more likely to, um, to actually generalize to making accurate predictions about future observations. So that's the motivation for the complexity being useful. Um, so now that we've talked for a, a fairly long time now about how the perception process works in active inference, um, now we want to move on to the actual action component. Um, and here, the idea is that action is just about control over state transitions. So essentially what we do is we have um, one of these sets of transition beliefs over time for each policy. Um, so each policy is a possible sequence of actions. So like choosing to take the hint and then choose the left machine or just immediately choosing the left machine. Um, and what that corresponds to is different types of transitions. So different B matrices essentially. Um, so each policy just entails a different sequence of state transitions. Um, so like transitioning from the start state to the take the hint state or transitioning from the start state to the choose the left machine state, for example. Um, so what we're doing then is we're predicting future observations under different possible state transitions. So if we get this, when we get this observation one, we are, we're trying to now, after we update our beliefs, we're trying to now predict based on our current beliefs, what observation two will be before we get it. Um, so you can actually think about this as just performing message passing in parallel for a bunch of different um, possible uh, hidden Markov models, the transition models I showed you before. So one policy could just be this model where we have transition uh, uh, beliefs, you know, B1 and transition beliefs B2. And then a second policy could just be one that has B1 and then a different set of transition prior beliefs, so B3. Um, and so in the context of the, um, of our kind of example model here, this just requires that we add a second state factor, so our choice states, um, and then a second outcome modality where we can observe losing or winning or a start state. Um, and so the way that we would do this um, is that, so we did the exact same thing as before, um, where we would make our observation here and we're, now we have the second outcome modality that corresponds to losing and winning. And so now we have this preference distribution where darker is higher probability. This is basically saying, I prefer to have a win versus a loss. Um, so now when we make that hint observation, um, we, that's after we choose the hint state, um, and then we update our beliefs now that the left machine is better. So now our belief, or we choose the transition to the choosing the left bandit state or the left slot machine state. Um, and then that results in us observing a win. Um, so that's adding the, the action component. So in other words, the agent just took the hint and then chose the left machine. Um, and just to show you how this is encoded, um, for example, one B matrix encoding uh, the action of choosing the left machine would just, you know, look like this, right? So it's just given any possible state I'm in, I will transition to this third state, which corresponds to choosing the left machine. Um, and then that could be for choosing the right machine, that could be for taking the hint, et cetera. So just to show you how it would actually be encoded. Um, so now policies themselves in these models depend um, on the expected free energy. Um, which is essentially evaluating how good is each policy. Um, and that in turn depends on C, which again is our, our preferred observations or, our, or what corresponds to reward. Um, and so the, what uh, expected free energy ultimately amounts to 
is um, stating that the policies with the, the lowest expected free energy are those that are expected to generate preferred outcomes, um, while at the same time maximizing information gain. Um, and just to show you, if you were to specify a particular um, C matrix here, um, it might look like this um, in actual models where this is tau equals one, two, and three. Um, and you might say, put negative ones here, right? So I don't want to lose, and then certain sorts of positive numbers here. I want to win with value four at time point two, and, but I'll only win $2 uh, at time point three if I take the hint first. Um, and then you would just soft max it and then log it, and what we actually use are these log probabilities. Um, and I'll just note here that um, this value four here, we could actually vary this, or it could be something we fit in an experiment, um, which corresponds to what we can call preference precision. Um, and we'll see that higher values for that end up reducing information seeking and increasing um, reward seeking. Um, so just to kind of go through what expected free energy is, so the variational free energy pertains to current observations, um, but remember that decision-making requires making um, predictions about future observations under each policy, and we can't calculate F um, without the observation. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking our predicted observations under a policy, um, and then we're calculating the expected free energy associated with each policy based on those expected observations. Um, now, the, the literature shows a lot of different decompositions of expected free energy. Um, the ones that are probably more intuitive um, are, uh, one is this one, which is the epistemic value and pragmatic value um, version. Um, and this, just kind of to walk you through it, this is just saying um, this is um, our beliefs about, uh, our approximate posterior beliefs about states um, before making an observation. And this is our approximate posterior beliefs after making an observation. So this is just saying, how much do I expect beliefs will change after a new observation if I choose this policy? Um, and note that there's a negative here, which means that the more I update my beliefs, so that the more my beliefs change, um, the, uh, the, the lower the expected free energy that will be. So this is actually maximizing information gain. So you want your beliefs to change more. Um, and then our pragmatic value is just the probability of the preferred observations. Um, so a, high, a lower expected free energy is going to maximize change in beliefs, so maximize information gain, while also maximizing the probability of, uh, of preferred outcomes or reward. Um, the other common decomposition you'll see is this risk and ambiguity um, version. And here, this is just the KL divergence between the observations you expect under a policy and your preferred observations. So again, this is just trying to get preferred observations as close as possible to expected observations. Um, and then the and then this is the ambiguity or the that corresponds to the entropy, um, which is a, a essentially a similar way of encoding, just another way of encoding how informative I expect observations to be. So here, for example, if in my likelihood state one will generate observation 1.0 with point probability 0.9 and observation two with only 0.1, whereas this one, state two will generate each with equal probability, then these observations aren't very informative. So I'd be driven toward choosing this one because it can actually disambiguate states. Um, and so this risk-seeking term is really just what I showed you before, where you're trying to find the policy that um, gets the expected observations to match the, the uh, preferred observations as closely as possible. Um, so the idea is that this this actually provides a, a principled approach to arbitrating um, the explore exploit dilemma, where policy selection is initially information seeking, so the ambiguity term dominates. Um, then the agent ends up levering that information to bring about preferred outcomes once it's confident. Um, so just to kind of review, so each policy in active inference entails a different set of state transitions. Um, and that in turn predicts a different sequence of observations and those jointly allow evaluation of the expected free energy. Um, and just to show you kind of in matrix form, this is um, what it would look like um, just based on the actual variables. And then our uh, probability of choosing each policy is just, um, just normalizing or soft maxing uh, negative G. Um, so a lower G pi then just corresponds to a higher probability of choosing that policy. Um, and then finally, what we do is we um, we often use this alpha parameter, which is like an action precision, which just controls how likely you are to choose the action associated with the best policy. So it controls the kind of the randomness in choice. 
Um, and as I mentioned, when the precision of the preference distribution goes up, that ends up making people more uh, risk seeking. Um, and just to show you an example of that, um, this is what it looked like as you, you know, as you saw before, the agent takes the hint when the preference distribution is moderate. Um, whereas if we made a very precise preference distribution, then instead the agent will typically, without being confident which one is correct, just choose one of the machines right away. Um, and in this case, it, it loses. So in this case, it took the guess immediately and lost. Um, so now the final um, bits that I'll, I'll walk through that are more just kind of like the, some, some bells and whistles that can be added but don't necessarily always need to be added um, in active inference models. So one is this E um, matrix here, or it's a vector, an E vector. And um, it's just a, a way of encoding habits um, and habit learning. So it's just a, a prior belief about what policy you'll choose. Um, and then gamma is, um, is the expected precision of the expected free energy. Um, so it's it's an inverse temperature parameter that um, basically what it does is it just encodes the confidence that an agent has in its action model. Um, so what ends up happening is, is that if gamma is low, so if the expected, if your confidence in G is low, then that ends up increasing the influence of habits um, or making your behavior more, more random. And that's just encoded like this. So if this number is lower, then G becomes downweighted and habits end up um, having a stronger effect. Um, and um, just to show you that this is just based on, um, uh, there's a hyperparameter um, on gamma, which is this beta parameter, which is a rate parameter in a gamma um, distribution. Um, and we just take the expected value of gamma, which ends up just being one over beta. Um, and that's just that's just how you have a prior on your expected uh, for energy precision. Um, uh, one other thing that, that often gets talked about in the um, neural process theory associated with active inference is that um, there is a, a scheme that um, has been proposed for how gamma, your actual confidence in your expected free energy can change after new observations. I mean, I won't go through this in a ton of detail, but the reason I mention it is just that um, it's actually been um, the part of the neural process theory that, um, you know, Carl Friston um, has um, proposed um, as, a, as something that could correspond to phasic dopamine responses. Um, and I'll just show you this, um, you know, briefly to, to go just uh, and point you toward the tutorial for more details. But all you're essentially doing is you're just taking what your beliefs were about policies before and after you get the variational free energy associated with the observation. And then um, this is the actual update equation, but essentially all this is doing is it's just saying, how consistent were my observations with my prior beliefs about G? So if the observations I got were very different than what the expected free energy entailed, then my confidence in the expected free energy goes down. Um, and then I can just update beta, which then updates gamma. Um, and so in this case, just to show you, you know, if it, say in this case, the agent expected that taking the hint was the best policy. And then after receiving the hint, it became more confident. Um, and so in this case, that was evidence that G was reliable. And so gamma goes up and that would be the, um, the simulated phasic dopamine response. And then the blue here would be the tonic change in expected change in dopamine, which is the tonic change in, in gamma. Um, and these are just, uh, if people wanna see them, a couple worked uh, examples in the tutorial um, for calculating this, but I'm just kind of pointing you toward the tutorial for that. Um, and there is one study just to point it out um, by Philip Schwartenbeck and, um, and colleagues that um, did show that gamma updates, simulated gamma updates um, correlated with neural responses um, in um, several regions, including the midbrain um, associated with dopamine. But the theory otherwise remains to be, um, remains to be thoroughly tested. Um, but this also leads us to um, the, um, the expanded kind of full neural process theory um, where the, um, the neural activity and the synaptic weights are no longer just about states and prediction errors. Instead, they also encode the policy probabilities, predicted observations under policies, the state probabilities under each policy, the expected free energy, preferred observations, um, and also gamma and the, uh, and the uh, prior beliefs, if they're included. Um, now, probably, I'll, um, I was going to show you some examples of um, how Ex, um, exploitation, so information seeking kind of reduces 
with learning. Um, I guess I probably won't go into that for sake of time, but we can go back to it. Um, but this is just kind of showing essentially different behaviors if a if with a risk averse agent with a smaller preference distribution versus a, a more risk seeking agent. Um, and um, again, I can go back through this um, maybe in the um, in the Q and A if people are interested. But the the key point here is is just by um, by simulating these sorts of behaviors um, over time, we can also generate predicted neural response time courses both for the, the dopamine predictions, um, the, the gamma, and also for RERPs and how those would change over trials in a task. Um, so the, the very last thing I'll cover just in the, in the last couple of minutes here is, um, is active learning. Um, and the idea here is that there's actually two different types of exploration in active inference. So one is state exploration, which is what we've been talking about. So seeking out information about hidden states. Um, so figuring out by taking the hint, which of the two machines is better, for example, but there's also something called parameter exploration. And that's where you're actually seeking info, seeking um, information to update your beliefs about the parameters itself. So in this case, like updating your beliefs about whatever the, the reward probabilities are, or, or figuring out how confident, how, how good the hints are, for example, so be learning to change your beliefs in, in say, like the A matrix. Um, and that's driven by an, an added term to the expected free energy when learning is included. Um, and it's based on using um, what are called Dirichlet distributions, um, which are just um, in Dirichlet categorical models. These are just priors that are often used on the um, with categorical distributions, which which are the kinds of distributions we've been working with in my examples. Um, so to skip that, um, but basically the um, what the Dirichlet concentration parameters do, we just represent them with small a's. And these are essentially just beliefs in this case about the probability for each entry in the A matrix. So the probability of losing given, you know, choosing the left machine, um, et cetera. Um, so, and these are counts. Um, basically, every time you make a new observation, then you just add a, add a value. So you just increase the value of each of them, of whatever one corresponds to the combination of observations and states in that trial. Um, so, and this is the, the equation for updating, which I, again, I can probably just go into in more, in more detail, um, but essentially it just amounts to counting coincidences between states and observations, which is a type of heavy in learning. So, so say we start out with concentration parameters like this. So it's just point twos all the way across. So just really small numbers. So we don't know whether the left machine or the right machine is more likely to win. Um, so let's say I observe a one here. So I observe a, a loss. Um, and I believe that I was in the right, you know, I chose the right bandit. So now, or the right slot machine. And so now I just add a one here. So now this entry has a 1.2 instead of a 0.2. And if I softmax these, so if I turn them each column back into probability distributions, then this one, right, the probability of losing given being in the right state will now have a much higher probability. Um, and then we can also, if we want to parameterize this, uh, the learning equation here with things like forgetting rates or learning rates if we want to. Those are things that we could like fit to behavior in, in empirical studies. Um, and so to do this, we have um, this uh, extra term in the expected free energy um, here. Um, and this novelty term essentially is just doing some of the same thing as with the epistemic term. You're just trying to change your beliefs about A as much as possible after observing a new state observation pair. Um, and that's based on, um, essentially the thing is just figuring out based on the sums um, in the concentration parameters, um, which essentially the column that has the, the smaller total number of counts will be the one that will be favored. Um, so just as a kind of final intuition here, um, the ambiguity term, if we, if this were what the counts were, so I've chosen left 100 times and seen 50 wins and 50 losses, and I've chosen the right machine two times and seen one win and one loss, the ambiguity term would be equivalent for both of these. So state exploration wouldn't change, but the novelty term would highly favor choosing the right machine again because I've seen so many fewer observations. Um, so I'll skip that for now. Um, but the idea, the final point is, is just that in empirical task modeling, um, 
we have these fixed parameters that we can fit to account for individual differences in behavior. So different people might have different preference precisions or different precisions of initial state priors or sensory precision or action precision or learning and forgetting rates and so forth. So we can just find the parameter values that best reproduce any participant's behavior in a model, and we can use those parameter values as individual difference measures. Um, and in the Q&A, if you'd like, I can provide specific examples of that from some of our empirical studies. Um, but so just to, just to, to close, um, so active inference describes perception learning and decision making, all in terms of this approximate Bayesian inference framework. Um, it uses this variational message passing scheme. Um, that's biologically plausible and it can generate neuroscientific predictions. Um, and it includes both this reward seeking and information seeking drive um, drives that can be helpful in um, explaining um, real human and animal behavior that um, does often involve a lot of information seeking. Um, and you can also include this active learning component um, um, as well as another type of information seeking. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Um, and just say thank you for listening, and I'm happy to start taking questions.